John Pilly taught me two important things, psychology and paddling. I'm now the Director of Undergraduate Studies of Psychology at Western Carolina University. I've been there 15 years and I uh, continue to paddle up through the Olympic trials. So he had a pretty profound impact on my life. The two greatest loves of my life, teaching and paddling, were both directly inspired by John Pilly. Um, within my teaching is probably even more important. He um, established a way of teaching that Perhaps until I heard comments today, I didn't even understand how central it was. Relationships first. Uh, and if anything has defined my teaching and my career, it's that. Relationships first. And as I listened to people today, I realized he uh, sort of sent me forth to replicate and repeat what he had done so successfully in his career. I hope I've done some of that, um, but I know that if I did it right, it was because I was emulating him. Whenever I stop walk around this campus or anywhere and I look at the beauty of the campus or the beauty of the sky or the beauty of the sun, I think of Pilly because that's what he got me doing and all my interactions with him is stopping to smell the roses, which is a pretty simple philosophy, but it has a pretty profound effect over the years when you, every bird song that you hear or every cloud scudding across the sky, you think of this man that um, got you to look and see the world in a different way. Everything that I have in my life, my wife, my children, I have a, had a career in Whitewater, uh, in the world of Whitewater, and I'm still at it. And it's because of that one interaction on the sidewalk here at Wofford College with John Pillen. Um, so you can, in my life at least, I can go back to that touch touch point and go, if I, he hadn't touched me, I'm not sure where I would have wound up, but it wouldn't have been where I am now and I'm internally grateful. John Pilly was on a scholarship committee that I was on, which is now called the Walford Scholar Program. When I was a senior in high school, it was called the King Team Program. So it's two students from every high school in the state would come to Walford and we compete for, a, for four scholarships. So John and I became friends that way. I never did the kayaking thing with him. Uh, I met Robin when she came to Walford, and then later uh, Debbie Pilly, who we also call Pilly, uh, would come to the library to study. And Robin and I would go to the New Way Lounge and drink beer. And then we would come back, and Robin would pick up Pilly. It was a very studious, non-drinking junior and then senior in high school. And she practiced music over at uh, Converse. So we all became friends and have been friends ever since. And John and I became friends because of the, uh, you know, interacting on scholarship programs, trying to figure out how to get kids scholarships to offer financial aid um, and that sort of thing. Oh friends, no more these sounds. Let us sing more cheerful songs, more full of joy. Joy, beautiful spark of the gods. Daughter of Elysium, fire inspired, we tread thy sanctuary. Thy power, thy magic power reunites all that custom has divided. All men become brothers under the sway of thy gentle wings. Whoever has created an abiding friendship or is one a true and loving partner, all who can at least call one soul their own, join in our song of praise. All creatures, all creatures drink of joy at nature's breast. Join our song of praise. Well, deep peace of the quiet earth to you, deep peace of the running wave to you, deep peace of the flowing air to you. We gather today to celebrate the joy that John Pilly brought to our lives and to our world. On behalf of John's family, I want to extend their appreciation to you for taking time <clears throat> to be here today and share in this significant moment. 
Today, our celebration will be enhanced by storytellers and, as you've already heard, wonderful musicians. In a moment, our first storyteller, C. Edward Coffey, will come. Again, thank you for your presence here today. As we celebrate the joy that John Pilly brought to many people and to several species, may the joy of the running river be yours. Deep peace, deep joy to you. To Pilly's beloved family, Sally, Robin, Debbie, Jay, Aiden, and yes, Chaser, to Pilly's Wofford family, faculty, staff, and students, and to all of Pilly's many, many friends. We gather this afternoon on this beautiful campus to remember and celebrate an extraordinary man, an educator, a scientist, a mentor, who embodied so much that is the best of Wofford College. Many of you here today have heard me say often that I became a person at Walford College. That incredible transformation was created through my relationships with the phenomenal students and staff and faculty here at Walford, among the most influential of whom, at least to me, was John Pilly. And so to be invited to stand and speak of Pilly is a profound privilege that I will treasure forever. I first met Pilly, we call him Pilly, not John. I first met Pilly in 1972 when, as a junior here at Walford, I began my major in the Department of Psychology. It was a remarkable time at the college. Dr. Joe Lassane had just been appointed Walford's ninth president. And for the first time in the history of this all male college, women would be admitted on campus as day students to take classes here at Walford. I didn't appreciate at the time just how lucky a man I was about to become. And Joe, I want to thank you again for making that happen. As an aside, does anyone here recall what the tuition was in 1972? $3,100. And I still couldn't afford it. Uh, <laughs> There was also great energy and excitement in that, at that time in Walford's Department of Psychology. Under the remarkable leadership of Dr. Jim Seegers, the department had developed a core group of faculty that had earned the reputation of being engaging teachers, thought leaders in their fields, and perhaps most importantly, mentors who were approachable and who understood the importance of the mentoring relationship to the future success of Walford's students. Pilly was one of those remarkable faculty, having been recruited by Dr. Seegers in 1969, straight out of psychology grad school. Now at the age of 40, Pilly was a little older than the average newly minted psychology grad student or graduate, but that was because he had had a previous career as a Presbyterian minister. Clearly, Pilly was one of those people who thought about the big issues in life and who cared about the welfare of his fellow man. Pilly brought this altruism and big issues perspective with him to the classroom. His classes introduced students to a way of understanding the world, and in particular human behavior, that has served as an essential intellectual foundation for me and for everything I've learned since. Pilly was a great scientific thinker. He taught us how to evaluate information, so critical today how to separate the wheat from the chaff, and to be humble about what we think we know. This humility, a trait that came natural to Pilly, by the way, meant that we also had to be lifelong learners, constantly open to new ideas and to new ways of understanding our world. And so it should come as no surprise to anyone that after his retirement from Walford in 1995, Pilly continued his lifelong learning, and in collaboration with Dr. Alliston Reed, Pilly conducted decades, after retirement, decades of groundbreaking research with his beloved pet dog, Chaser. Research that has transformed our understanding of language and animal intelligence. 
Pilly's success in working with Chaser involved the same strategies that he employed with his students at Wofford. Engage in a caring relationship, make learning fun, and channel the students' natural drives, their natural curiosity and thirst for learning. Pilly was a master at leveraging relationships. He understood that a student's time at Wofford was much less about the credential and much more about the relationships. He knew that a student's future success was critically dependent upon the relationships that that student developed with his fellow students, with the faculty, and with the college. It was about expanding the cohort of people who care about you because of what you care about. Pilly made learning fun. And many of his lessons were taught during Friday afternoon social occasions down in his lab. We played music, thanks to our guitar virtuoso, Chris Harris. We sang and we danced. And all while we're doing this, Pilly has us cleaning out rat and pigeon poop from the animal cages. <laughs> he was a master. These social gatherings might have appeared spontaneous to a casual observer, but they were clearly a result of an environment that Pilly worked very hard to create, nurture, and sustain. Pilly and Sally also frequently opened their home to students, where we enjoyed Sally's delicious pound cake. We still have the recipe. And where the music and singing continued into the wee hours of the morning, or at least until 9 o'clock when Pilly was ready for bed. <laughs> it was all so much fun. It made learning fun. And it all started with the caring relationships that Pilly and his family forged with his students. As you all know, Pilly had a great love for the outdoors, and he taught himself to become quite an accomplished whitewater paddler. Pilly, the paddling professor, as we grew to, to call him, uh, would take us along on these trips on many occasions, trips which provided fantastic opportunities to continue the fun and the learning. It was during one of those whitewater trips that Pilly and I had a conversation which I have never forgotten. It was a beautiful, sunny spring afternoon, and as we were paddling, we were talking about race relations in this country, if you can believe that. I shared with Pilly a personal experience I had as a young teenager in the spring of 1968, shortly after the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King had been assassinated. I was working as a bag boy in the Agin Peak grocery store in North, in North Myrtle Beach. At the time, it was called Ocean Drive Beach. Um, it was changeover day for the beach house rentals, and the store was slammed. I had not had a break or lunch, and I was physically dragging. I was exhausted. It was also sweltering with unbelievably high humidity, and the air conditioning, such as it was back in 1968, was simply incapable of providing any relief. I had just loaded 12 bags of groceries onto this, these carts, uh, this triple-decker cart that I really couldn't even see over, and I was dreading the trip out to the customer's car. Suddenly, I had a brilliant idea. I realized that I could save myself one full second of time by taking the cart out the store through the indoor which happened to be every bit of three feet closer than the outdoor, which I should have, should have used. Now, unbeknownst to me, at the same time, an elderly African-American gentleman was approaching the store, which he planned to enter the proper way through the indoor. I didn't know his name, but he was a familiar figure at the store. He was a farmer, a local farmer, and he raised fresh vegetables, sold those vegetables to the store. We were his main customer. So here I go barreling out the end door, my head down for extra momentum, totally blind to what might be in front of me, while at the same time, the farmer prepares to enter the store through the end door, pushing his rickety wooden buggy full of the vegetables he'd worked so hard to grow and harvest that week. Well, you know what happened next. I plowed directly into the farmer and his buggy, knocking him off his feet and his buggy off the sidewalk, 
All the vegetables rolled, it was like slow motion, rolled into the, to the street and were squashed by all the cars going by. There wasn't one vegetable that survived. I was, of course, horrified, and I ran to help the gentleman to his feet. He kept his head bent and never really made eye contact with me. But after getting up and brushing himself off, he said, excuse me, sir. He then picked up his wooden buggy and drug it back to his truck. He had to drag it because in the collision, I had destroyed both the wheels on the buggy. I was very ashamed of what I had done and, and totally confused by the farmer's apology to me as I was clearly the offended party. And of course, all this played out again only weeks after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. I told Pilly that I had often wondered what Dr. King might have said to me about this interaction in South Carolina in 1968 between a careless white 16-year-old boy and an elderly African-American farmer just trying to make a living. After some discussion with Pilly, we concluded that Dr. King might have offered two pieces of advice. First, don't ever go out the end door again. <laughs> Read the sign, follow the rules, do the right thing. And the second piece of advice, make sure the door is open for everyone. I think about this conversation often because it so beautifully captures Pilly's specialness. His dry wit and his wonderful sense of humor, don't go out the end door, as well as his love and respect for people and his deep conviction that we should treat everybody fairly. We should treat everyone the same. Can you imagine being on a day-long canoe trip with your college professor and having this kind of conversation? It was life-changing, it was Wofford, and it was John Pilly. I would suggest that Pilly's advice that day on the river remains every bit as relevant today. Are we opening doors when we build border walls or when we pass voter ID laws or when we legislate who people can and can't marry? And how many doors are closing as the income gap in this country gets wider and wider? Are we opening doors when we discredit and undermine a woman for waiting years before she comes forward with an alleged sexual assault. And what about those prison doors? Why is it that one in nine black children in this country have a parent in prison? One in nine, compared with just one in 57 white children. In my field of health care, we opened some doors a few years ago when we expanded health care insurance coverage in this country. But more recently, those doors are closing again. As such, we continue to have marked disparities in health between peoples in our country. Millions of lives are ravaged by opiate addiction. And the suicide rate continues to grow. It rose 30% in the past 15 years in this country compared to other developed countries, including Great Britain, for example, where the rates are lower and actually going down. And so, as we gather here today to remember Pilly and to celebrate his incredible life, perhaps we have an opportunity to truly honor him by following the advice he gave that day on the river. Let us think about the doors around us. Which, one are, which ones are open and which ones are closed? Who is getting in and who is shut out? Which doors could we open for somebody else? Can you imagine what a difference it would make if each one of us here today made a commitment to open just one door for someone on the other side? Can you think of any better way to honor the life of John Pilly? May God bless John Pilly. May God bless this exceptional college he loved and served so well. When 
I first came to Wofford College, Frank Logan let me in saying that I wasn't really Wofford material. He was truthful with me. Uh, and I'm glad that I didn't know Dr. Singh then. <laughs> but when I got into Wofford, I got a hold of John Billy. And from then on, my life was totally different. Two years earlier, I'd been in a helicopter crash and put me in a wheelchair. And so I just started this school that has no ramps, no wheelchair accessibility. And the only thing I know about it is John Pilly. I was told to get in touch with John Pilly by Frank Logan. So I did. Boy, I tell you what, you talk about someone who's changed your life. I, I'm trying to work in a wheelchair. ADA wasn't started yet. There's no real rules for it. You just catch as catch can. The school fortunately built me some ramps. They put it over in Carlisle. Then they tore the building down. <laughs> Then they built one to the top floor of the Black Science Annex. And then they put me and Billy in the bottom. <laughs> they did real good. But like Eddie said, in the bottom of that Black Science Annex is where things started for me. That's where Billy started to push me. And he started to see something in me that I couldn't see in myself. I'm still not sure what it was, but it almost brings me to tears that I didn't tell him before now. But he pushed me in a way. I'll tell you a story. We went to Europe. He got me out of Wake Forest in my master's program after I graduated to come be a chaperone for Wofford during an interim. Me being a chaperone for Wofford. <laughs> it's like the old fox in the hen house thing. So now Billy and I are in charge of all these Wofford students that we're going to Europe. I'm in a wheelchair, I don't know what I'm doing. But Pilly didn't care. Pilly pushed. When he decided he wanted to learn to kayak, Guess who had the kayak with him? Yeah. They call it a rubber ducky. That's what they put me in, is a rubber ducky. It kind of came up around the side of me and held on. I get so mad, I grab a little kayak and flip them. But I learned to kayak with Pilly. And I went to Europe with Pilly. And when we went to the top of the Beluga Bond, I couldn't get up there. The gondola going up was just too small for the wheelchair. So Pilly said, he knows the way I can do it. So I get myself out of the wheelchair onto a floor that's that's the guys in my chinos. <laughs> and then they take the wheelchair, fold it up, hold it up over the head, and we ride the gondola up. But I got to of the Beluga Bond. I got to the top of the Arc de Triomphe because Allison carried me up there. Really pushed me to do things I never knew I could do, which affect me today. I learned that I got to go to Purdue to get my doctorate. I didn't know what it's going to be like at Purdue. 44 inches of snow the first year. Wheelchairs and snow don't get along. <laughs> but the reason I went is because I knew in my head, Pilly would say, go get your doctor. If that's where you want to go, go. Well, that's where I wanted to go. And they helped and they made do, and I did it. But every bit of this is due to Pilly. And Pilly has been with me from day one 
when I started here and all the way through, all the way up until he left. <clears throat> he even got me to when Dr. Lusane handed out his first time handing out diplomas as my class. And Dr. Billy got me to do a wheelie across the stage <laughs> to get my diploma. And he said that he and a bunch of other guys were going to get up in the, in the um, <coughs> audience and holler. So I'm behind the curtain. I'm watching Dr. Lusane do this wonderful job and all this pomp and circumstance. And I'm deciding whether I'm going to do this or not. Well, you just don't let Pilly down. <laughs> so unfortunately, I did it, didn't I, Dr. Lewis? I popped right up there. <laughs> I went right up, went right across, got it. They jumped up and hollered, and that was that. It was a wonderful thing. But like Eddie said, I think that Billy had more of, a, of an effect on our lives that we'll ever really know, and I know he did on mine, because I couldn't manage and do the things that I had done, because my parents weren't here, nobody was here. To me, Pilly was almost like a father. For four years, three years I was here. And I couldn't see it any other way. And I didn't let Frank Logan down, because I knew that if I got bad grades, I couldn't do the things with Billy that I that we were doing. Because you can't do that if you're not getting good grades. So even Frank Logan doesn't know how much Billy affected me. But I need for you all to know that. That he really pushed. And he pushed in a good way. And he pushed in a mentorish way. And a professorial way. And even in a fatherly way. To help me through what was a really difficult time in my life, along with the students and others and everybody that I had here. And I really appreciate the opportunity of being able to tell this story to you. Thank you. So I stood in front of my closet a little while ago and looked at my two ties, and I, and I said, what, is, what would Pilly want me to do? And I could, I could feel him rolling in his ashes, if, you, if, if that's the way to, to put it, and I said, I'm, I'm not going there, so I'm showing up with, without the tie. He gave me a lot of fashion advice. Um, <laughs> It's impossible to describe the immense gratitude I hold for the long life of John Pilly and for the decades-long relationship I've had with his family, Sally, Debbie, Robin. Thank you all so much for, for asking me to speak today. Pilly died on a Sunday morning a couple months ago, just shy of his 90th birthday. Mentor, friend, fellow traveler, on his favorite metaphoric route, the hero's journey, John Pilly taught me to roll a kayak, scout a rapid, swim out of danger if my roll failed, and get back in my boat and head downstream. Life skills that have served me well, and they served Pilly well, on and off the river. In my favorite picture of us, we are on the Chatuga. Section three, almost 14 years ago now, on my 50th birthday, Pilly was already 77, still paddling the hard stuff. There's a high water mark of jumbled logs from a recent flood, and I'm pointing up at it. John stands beside me laughing at the signs of nature's cyclic flooding the way Joseph Campbell had taught him to look for metaphors everywhere. John spent his early adulthood as a Presbyterian minister, then he came to be a much beloved professor and mentor to so many of us here this afternoon. I never had him for a class. I, I, um, 
uh, this is not in my prepared marks, remarks, but, but um, the, only, the, the time, the only experience I had with John Pilly in um, college was um, I, I signed up for a canoe trip um, to go to the Nantahala River and um, showed up that morning. That Sunday was um, there were there were six or seven of us, and I was put into a canoe with one of my friends, and we drove up to the river. And before we got to the Nantahala, there's a little pull off on the right, and there's a really big rapid called Worser Wesser. Um, it's a a jumble of rocks that the railroad had blown through to, to cut off a, um, a, a piece of the river so they'd get logs through early in the century. And Pilly got us all out of the car, and he took us over there, and he got up on a rock, and he starts talking about how we're, we're going to run this rapid later in the afternoon, and we're scared to death. Um, and um, then he finishes, and we get back in the car, and we drive upstream and put in way up the river and come down. I flip two or three times, and um, we get to the bottom to the where the restaurant was, and we're, well, we're, we got one more rapid, right? And he says, no, 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 that was all just a big joke. So, <laughs> so, so that, that fear kind of kept us um, going, and, and we didn't have quite as much fear the rest of the way down the river. After retirement, when many of us would just fold the tent in his seventh and eighth decade, Pilly became an internationally renowned and publicly admired scientist. That period, what I'd call the chaser years, is something many who speak here this afternoon will highlight. But what I want to celebrate is his 50-year relationship with rivers, much of which I got to experience with him. I was a slow learner. <laughs> right, Sally? <laughs> I was a real slow learner. I got to be pretty good, but I was a slow learner. My early river trips with Pilly were often punctuated with moments of sheer terror by me as I swam down a whitewater rapid with, after an inglorious flip and an attempt or two at three poorly ex executed combat roles. But Pilly was always there to rescue me, and I counted on it, maybe too long. My first trip down infamous section four of the Chattooga was with Pilly. I wrote about Pilly and that trip in my book, Chattooga, and I'd like to read you what I wrote. Just a few paragraphs. <laughs> read the whole book. No. <laughs> He's all through the book, so I could read the whole book, and it would all be about Pilly. I remember clearly how terrible an ordeal that first trip through Five Falls had become can become. My first time through the gorge, I was with Pilly. I'd already flipped at the top of a rapid called Seven Foot Falls, and so I wasn't feeling especially confident. That day, he led me through the setup for a rapid called Entrance, and I followed. I flipped and set up to roll in the pool at the bottom. I missed my roll, but I kept trying over and over and over. Pilly was beside me, but we were drifting toward another rapid with a scarier name called Corkscrew, one of the most difficult of the five falls. I was hanging there in my boat upside down, still trying to roll, but tiring quickly with no success riding myself at all. And Pilly leans over and yells, your space brace skirt has popped, your boat's full of water. And then he paddled up beside me. Out of instinct, I reached out and grabbed Pilly's boat, and the two of us drifted toward the approach to Corkscrew. Pilly looked down at my hands, holding his grab loop, <laughs> and he said, Lane, let go of my boat. <laughs> You're on your own. I let go, and Pilly swiftly disappeared down the rapid, perfectly, of course, perfect run. I flushed through Corkscrew's atomic flume, a terrible feeling, upside down in my boat, a terrible feeling, tossing, banging, sliding through the Chattooga's famous spin cycle. The only thing to be said for swimming Corkscrew is, if you're lucky and avoid the two major hydraulics, it's over really fast. <laughs> this time, I was lucky. At the bottom, Pilly was waiting to pull me over. 
A rope hit me in the head and I grabbed on and a friendly kayaker tugged me to shore. So I just want to tell Pilly that I've let go of his boat and I'm on my own. Thank you, John. And now Robin Pilly will come. Going, coming together? Okay. And Deb Pilly Bianchi. They will conclude our storytelling time. I want to remind you that following our gathering here, we will all move over to the Papadopoulos room where we will, again, enjoy some time together and raise a glass to John. Pilly's. So I didn't prepare anything. Here. Can y'all hear? I didn't prepare anything. I wanted whatever I said to be God-driven in this moment. Um, dad, mom and dad did a great job. Um, we didn't have much money growing up. They gave us experiences, though. When we were children, we, did, we didn't have toys and stuff like that, but we got experiences. We got to go camping and hiking and swimming and horseback riding, and then in our teen years, we learned to paddle, and um, that gave us a really good foundation for later in life to to feel confident about things and, and appreciate nature. Um, Dad was really able to share himself with people. And I think we all, all appreciate when somebody shares themselves with us, spends time, and sits down and really listens. Um, he, he shared himself. I worked for 15 years for Nantahala Outdoor Center. I became a trip leader on the Nantahala, and then a head guide, and then an assistant manager. Um, and I worked closely with Kathy Kennedy, who was the founders of NOC. She was their daughter. And, and she told me one day, uh, Robin, I wish I could share myself with people like you do, because when I lead raft trips, everything else goes away and I'm in the zone and nothing else matters. It just feels so great to be out on the river helping people, um, facilitating a fun and safe trip for people. Um, well, anyway, he shared himself with people. Um, I want to read something a, a friend of mine gave me a few days ago. Um, it's called The Dash. And I, I read this and, and um, all of a sudden, it, uh, well, let me just read it. I read of a man who stood to speak at a funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on the tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of birth and spoke of the following date with tears, but said what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time they spent alive on earth, and now only those who love them know what little, that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we lived and loved and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change for you never know how much time is left that still can be rearranged? To be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, 
remembering that this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things I say about how you lived your dash? Um, a woman named Linda Ellis wrote that, but my friend that gave this to me, it, it, I thought about it. Um, I met, met that man about eight years ago, and I spent... <laughs> I spent 30 minutes talking to him about something, and um, you never realize how you're going to impact somebody. But he, he told me later when I reconnect, I didn't see him for several years, and and when I saw him later, many years later, um, he said that 30, 30 minutes I spent with him made a profound difference in his life really profound. I, I don't want to go into all the details about it, but I had had no idea. Um, but I, I stopped and shared myself with that man for 30 minutes. That's all it took. And it made such a big difference in his life. So I, I'm, I'm not going to be dashing around. <laughs> I want to slow down. Dad did that. He shared himself with the students. That's what made him such a wonderful um, mentor, how he shared himself. Not many people really do that and genuinely listen to who they're talking to. I'm going to let my sister take over now. Well, God, what an amazing um, afternoon, evening. And uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm, I'm Deb Pilly Bianchi. And uh, I just want to thank everyone for being here today. My father was so many things to many people, like we've heard today, but uh, to me, the greatest role of his was as a father. He was ever present in our lives, ever since we were really little. We were four years old and we were like rattling around in this big old Plymouth and going to the swimming pool swimming, singing, uh, she's a flame and mame and she's a red hot dame, she's the hottest baby in town. And those were things that dad engaged with us. A little inappropriate, but. We didn't know that at the time. <laughs> so one thing my friends used to always ask me is, does your dad, your dad's a psychologist, does he use psychology on you? <laughs> I was like, no, that's ridiculous. We're not science fair projects. <laughs> of course he used sci psychology on us. <laughs> I never knew that till way later. And um, <laughs> growing up, when we were naughty or doing something we weren't supposed to do, he delivered those words that no teenager ever wants to hear. And these were the harshest words he ever spoke to me. Honey, I'm not going to reinforce that behavior. <laughs> it's like, crap, man. I hate it when you say that. But his, his was a love story on many, many levels. And the largest, of course, was with my mom. They literally met in the psych ward at Philadelphia General Hospital. <laughs> he was a seminary student at Princeton, and my mom was a nursing student at Philadelphia General. And he was doing rounds with a Catholic priest. My mom was serving patients in the psych ward. And when he saw her, every time he, he told this story, he would say, she looked like an angel. And so he pursued her with the dogged determination and persistence that the whole world has come to recognize. And 
Fast forward three months after they met, and both of them have graduated. He's driven her back to her home in Atlantic City where he kisses her goodbye and they broke up, knowing the distance was gonna to be too great between Atlantic City and Memphis. And so, he makes the long trip after breaking up with her back to Princeton and he turns around and drives back to Atlantic City, knocks on her door at midnight, waking everybody up and says, will you marry me? You don't have to answer me now, don't answer now, but just want to know if you'll marry me. And he gets back in the car, goes to Princeton, and uh, he's waiting. So the next five days, he's supposed to be counseling the women's church group. But the whole time, he's asking them, what, what do you think she's thinking? Should I call her? <laughs> do you think she's going to say yes? How come I haven't heard from her? What should I do? do you, I think I, I love her so much. I don't know what to do. It's driving me crazy. And they're like, you are driving us crazy. Go back and ask her again. <laughs> Which he did. He shows up, asks her again, will you marry me? And she said, well, yes. Of course I'll marry you. I would have told you the other night, but you told me not to answer. <laughs> It was her love that enabled him to do great things. And as we have all witnessed, his great success came in his 80s when he gave the world confirmation that dogs are not only as smart as we think, but they are capable of so much more. He touched thousands of people around the world. And so many have reached out via email, social media, um, phone calls. And uh, he shaped their lives in positive ways with people he didn't know, even know. But one came from uh, one of his students, Louis, Walk Louis Walker. And she wrote him this, Dr. Pilly, I thoroughly enjoyed your book, Chaser. I just finished it and my wheels are turning. I graduated from Wofford in 1980 and Medical University of South Carolina in 1984, and I want to tell you, I did go on a canoe kayak trip with you and your group once. There were several first timers, and at the start you said, canoeing requires both people. When you have trouble maneuvering the canoe, you will feel certain that it is your partner causing the problem. <laughs> it probably is not. For some reason, that has stuck with me for over 30 years in many different situations, and whatever your exact words were that day, the take-home message to me was that what am I doing to create this situation, and what can I do to fix it? Thank you so much. Louis Lawson, MD. Then another one of the sweetest compliments he ever got was from a professional dog trainer in Australia, James Matura, and he said, uh, the first time I ever saw Chaser and your dad, I imagined, I imagined myself as an old man with my one and only dog. Now, I've got to tell you all that uh, uh, in all of my experience in the music industry, for you that, all that don't know me, I never thought all of that experience would culminate in managing an old man and a dog. <laughs> but it's the greatest honor to share his legacy. And now his legacy is my legacy, and it's your legacy. Right now, I'd like to just take a moment to thank everyone that are here again and the many people behind the scenes that have contributed so eagerly and, enthusiastic, and enthusiastically, especially Wofford College. And while some of these people are not speaking, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge their significant support, contribution, and influence to my father's work his work and play. You're all practically daily references of my dad. I've heard your names around the dinner table too many times. And I'm gonna let you know now, Alliston Reed. You are the son my father never had. 
You're the reason his work was released to the world. When speaking of you, he frequently highlighted that the student has long passed the teacher. You became his mentor. Leonore, Rebecca, and Caroline, you were his heart. He loved you all tremendously. Wayne West, you're the inspiration and the conduit that precipitated his research with Chaser. You showed him that science can sometimes overlook, overlook the most basic truths. The dogs are smarter than we think, and it confirmed his belief that if learning does not take place, we gotta change the methods because every living being has the ability to learn. Eddie Coffey, <laughs> you were the prince, and clearly now you're the king. Chris Harris, you were seriously his partner in crime. Your playfulness and your thirst for adventure matched his own. John Lane, you were his muse. You're also the student that took the longest time to learn to paddle. <laughs> Jim Seegers, you are the essence of all things dad cherished, knowledge, family, beauty, and grace. Terry Ferguson, you're his rock and source of trivia. Ron Robinson, your blessing of the animals was his connection to the divine. Lee Haglin, <laughs> you were his football and basketball buddy. And paddling, and of course, all things Bach. Hillary, Hillary Hinsman, you told his story in co-writing the Chaser book so brilliantly, finding his voice and merging the science so seamlessly with the day-to-day. -day. We're forever grateful. Bernie Dunlap, you are the Lobster King. Laura Corbin, girl, you the Raymaker. Marco Linke, you've silently documented my father's voyage with Chaser, and through your beautiful, candid photography, you allow us to be time travelers. John Blair, you are the gatekeeper. Personally, I'd like to thank a few people. First, Joyce. Radica and Frank Hodges, Liz Brooks and Jan Scott, Lisa St. Odin and Gary McGraw, Nave Samhat and Jim Oliver, Nadia Kodakowska and Dave Heath, and you too, Jay. <laughs> I'm sure that there are people missing from this list, so I apologize in advance. <laughs> but with his so many others, he constantly encouraged me to follow my bliss. If there's anything that we can take away from his magical life, it's to communicate joy. Speaking thoughtfully, what we say matters. Words matter. Act with kindness. This matters. Listen with your heart wide open. And as he said to me once in a letter, be in the moment. It's all you will ever have. His philosophy is summed up so beautifully in the lyrics of Ode to Joy, which is one of his favorites, Beethoven's Ninth. These are the lyrics. Oh friends, no more these sounds. Let us sing more cheerful songs, more full of joy. Joy, beautiful spark of the gods. Daughter of Elysium, fire inspired, we tread thy sanctuary. Thy power, thy magic power reunites all that custom has divided. All men become brothers under the sway of thy gentle wings. 
Whoever has created an abiding friendship or has won a true and loving partner, all who can at least call one soul their own, join in our song of praise. All creatures, all creatures drink of joy at nature's breast. Join our song of praise. Now, I know my dad is here, and music is one of his greatest gifts. They're the film score of our lives. I'd like to invite some friends up that are going to help us with this song of joy. I've got Lisa St. Odom, and I've got Brenda Leonard. I also have a few of the talented musicians from the Spartanburg Symphony who have been so generous in collaborating with us. So don't forget their first concert of the seasons tomorrow night. <laughs> After this, we're going to head on over to the Papadopoulos building. We're going to raise a glass. We're going to have a little food. We're going to tell some stories. And we're going to celebrate the wondrous life of my father, John Pilly.